Man, look at all these impatient people in the live chat over there. <laughs> Vince and I were talking backstage, and all of a sudden the comment section started filling up, and all these people are like, oh, come on, start the show. Start the show. Glad you're here. Yes. We're glad to get started. No doubt. And, and we do not have any breaking news. I know somebody put that out there as a possibility for yeah. uh, why we were a little tardy. But uh, the real reason is I'll take the blame. Everyone wants to read into everything. I know, right? You know, along those lines, right? <laughs> yes, it's my fault. It's my fault that we're late uh, because of my progeny. It's the first day of track practice here in the state of Indiana. He had track. I was waiting for him. TikTok, buddy, let's go. Supposed to end at 5.30. He got to my office about 5.45. I was like, we got to go. So, yeah, we're, we're going to have to tighten that up a little bit. We're going to tighten it down. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, what if I told you another Notre Dame assistant coach is leaving? Not, not really happening. I'm just I'm just messing with you. Just messing with you. Well, I thought we shouldn't the, have even joked about that because <laughs> I thought the internet was messing with me when we got the email at 622 on Super Bowl Sunday. I, I was mean, on my way home. And what? Because you know, the women's game ended like right before yeah. six, and then I had to do the post-game show. And like, you know, it's like buzzing through the post game show. It's like, all right, let's keep this moving. Let's keep this moving. Right. Chris. And then I, you know, I, I'm listening to uh, the radio. I'm like, okay, well I can, you know, hear the first few minutes. Well, they were still doing the national anthem and I literally pulled in my driveway nice. right as the game was kicking off. Nice. So, Good timing. So all of that, that, you know, the Harry news, you know, dropping, 20 minutes before the kickoff of the Super Bowl happened while I was driving home yesterday. Yeah. That was I don't know. Like I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm getting I'm getting nestled in, like I'm getting ready for the Super Bowl. All of a sudden, bing, email. I'm like, who's sending me an email on Sunday night? Oh. Didn't see that one coming. <laughs> yeah, not at all. <clears throat> not at all. So do you want to do Sort of an update on Andy Ludwig first, and then we get into the Harry stuff. Or sure. which, which which way do you want to go? That works. Yes. Yeah, That's we'll weird. go oldest to newest. I mean, we don't have a lot to update, and I know you and Brian did a did a show over the weekend on Andy Ludwig. Basically, it's Monday night as we you know record this slash do this live. Anyone's watching, anyone who's watching knows it's Monday night. But this you know podcast obviously goes up on the the audio platforms the next day. So it's Monday night, six o'clock Eastern time. And as of now, uh, the information that we have is the same as we've had for the last yep. couple of days. There's, there's an offer out there. We're still waiting right now. Correct. That's as far as I know how this thing is working. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, Andy Ludwig decides that this is the place he needs and slash wants to be. And, he gives the okay because again we we've we've pontificated about this for a while. Brian and I did a show about it on Saturday. You and I talked about it a bunch last week. Andy Ludwig is is in my top tier home run hire category, right? I mean, he just is. And if they can pull this off, if they can get him to come over, I'm ecstatic, absolutely ecstatic about the hire. So. Yeah, hopefully he's he's doing his due diligence and he's doing his thing and just kind of going through it and and figuring out if this is where he wants to be. But hopefully the end game is that that is what he wants to happen and we'll all be happy at the end of the day. I do kind of wonder now a couple of different things. One, remember it was a year ago at this time. Now the scenario, the situation was a little bit different, but Super Bowl was on Sunday. On Tuesday, I believe it was Tuesday, we had that was right. We had the press conference with Al Golden and Tommy Reese and Brian Mason. They were all announced. And of course, Al Golden was the last one. You know, Tommy was already here. Brian Mason was brought in, and Al Golden was the last one officially announced. You know, so two days after the Super Bowl, we had that press conference. I'm not expecting a press conference tomorrow, but what I'm saying right. is, you know, it's like we're right around the same, and we're not expecting a guy to come over from the NFL, but at the same time, the Harry thing does, you know, I don't know, throw a wrench, but it, at least add a different layer to what's going on with yeah. Ludwood being the top guy, you know, the, the top guy candidate, whatever, you know, the guy with an offer out there right now, because it does give Andy Ludwig 
the potential to bring somebody with him here now to Notre Dame. Whereas before the right. staff was, was filled up, there's that possibility. And maybe there's some extra discussion going on now because the offer was – now, Marcus Freeman, I'm sure, knew it was coming. So he did. how much those conversations were had – you know, while Ludwig is, was here in town for a couple of days. The way I understand the timeline, and this is not news to anybody that's on the message board, the way I understand the timeline is Harry kind of informed them at the beginning of the week, uh, last week, middle to, or beginning to middle of the week. And so obviously they didn't even do any of the offensive coordinator interviews until that news had kind of already broke within the Goog, right? And I think they spent some time trying to convince Harry to stick around. But at the end of the day, I am sure that that was part of the interview process. So, you know, that was sure. I, it had to have been part of the conversation that, hey, yeah. there's a good chance that this could be an open position. Let's talk about that. You know, what would right. you like to see if that was the case? Right. So I'm sure that that conversation was had. I, I don't know, you know, what direction that went, obviously, but the whoever the new offensive coordinator is going to be, they're going to have a say in how that position is filled. Yeah. And I mean, there's, you know, a lot of talk about Jim Harding, who's been the <clears throat> offensive line coach under Andy Ludwig out there at Utah. And someone on the boards today posted a Utah uh, YouTube show. I don't know if you saw. I did not. That, but, you know, there's you know, some mixed, I guess, but, the, you know, there's talk about, whether or not maybe Harding, you know, he's a longtime assistant. He's been there at Utah for a long time about whether or not he would, you know, if Ludwig moves on about, you know, not necessarily following Ludwig, whether he would become the offensive coordinator out there. There's some of that. So, yeah. you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot to, you know, it's it, so it's not necessarily all well. Andy Ludwig can just bring his guy along with him and he can be the offensive line coach. It might be, you know, if he takes it. Yeah. You know, again, there's other layers to it. This guy might be in the mix for the offensive coordinator position there. It might not be a slam dunk. And so then Marcus Freeman and Ludwig still need to find an offensive line coach. So there's there's more to of, it. Yeah, a lot of layers, a lot of dominoes to fall, you know, all of those different things. And you know what? This is still a very attractive position. Offensive coordinator slash, you know, offensive line slash quarterback. Like those three positions, two actual positions it's very attractive and you know whoever they end up getting is going to be a good hire i would hope so <clears throat> i love the people out there that are saying that the first guy they brought in declined the job yeah, that's not exactly how that went down uh, he did not decline the job he did not turn it down he was never offered the job so right I you heard have that on the radio on the way over here by the way yeah well, of course you did yeah i mean that idiot you know <laughs> Thinks that Greg Olson is the best color commentator ever. Oh my God. And I couldn't help but send that to you. <laughs> and he's also the same. Yeah, you know, he needs things explained to him because he's covered football for nearly a quarter of a century. Is that right? Would that be a quarter? Yeah, 25 yeah. years. Yeah. He's covered football, big time football, and he still needs football explained to him by a TV analyst. That's why he thinks Greg Olson is the best because. Greg Olson can talk down to him enough to explain the game of football to him. <laughs> oh, it's classic, classic. Who are, yeah, talk, by the way, who are we talking about, Vince? Uh, who are we? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But I almost drove off the side of the road. Well, reports say that you know it was already turned down by some. Okay, see, not even ballsy enough to say it, but he said reports say. But... Well. It, you know, and the thing specifically with Colin Klein, and, and things happen like this in job interviews all the time. You yeah. go, you interview. Just by interviewing, you make yourself, hey, you know, we, we were kind of having this conversation with things like Leftwich and Brian Johnson and all that. Just by having your name connected to it and by interviewing, at the very least, you turn yourself into a more wanted commodity. And it, as a Kansas State offensive coordinator, it – it gives you a little cachet to say you interviewed at Notre Dame and you stayed at Kansas State. It doesn't mean you turned down the job. It means right. that you had a conversation, you interviewed, you guys talked, and, you know, for whatever reason, it wasn't the right fit. Because right. from what everything we understand, there was no offer made. So there was nothing to no. turn down. No. 
And there's a reason that Joe Moorhead just got a, a contract extension, you know? I mean, because he had interest from Alabama, from potentially Notre Dame. I know there was a conversation, you know, that was had. It didn't go very far, obviously, but he parlayed all of that interest into a contract extension. I mean, that that yeah. is what happens this time of year. So everybody needs to understand that. Everybody's, you know, uh, agents are going to spin it one way or the other to benefit their client. And Klein did that. Moorhead is doing that. It is what it is. And I'm sure if for whatever reason the Andy Ludwig decides to stay at Utah, he'll probably get a raise uh, in the deal. So Yeah, and that's what, you know, like I saw Derek made the comment, no news is good news. <laughs> I don't know if I agree with that. Because, well, oh. Like okay, the go longer ahead. it goes, like the things, like it's, it's like, okay, is this a negotiate? At the very least, like, is he trying to negotiate to get more, or you know, whatever? Sure. At Utah, you know, it's like, uh, you just, yeah, that's fair. You just never know. That's fair. All right. I mean, <clears throat> sometimes you know, like, this whole process has only gone on for a little bit more than a week, right? So. Really, I thought that this was to go from where they went, you know, Friday will be two weeks. I thought it was, you know, a two to three week process, probably. Sure. It might take longer. Than, so just the fact that they're this close, and I think yeah. you probably I might have said that as well. The fact that they're this close already, to me, is good because they've been able to zero in on somebody quickly. So, you know, it's like that balance between, oh, it's taking a long time. And, you know, like the, the right. entire process to this point really hasn't taken that long when you think about Agreed. it. Agreed. I thought it's been pretty darn speedy, to be honest with you. And if we know who, now they're not going to announce it for a while, okay? But we're going to find out a lot sooner than them announcing it. So right. when we find out, if we find out over the next couple of days, that's huge. A Alabama took 12 days, for goodness sake. Notre Dame's at 10. So let's at least get to 12 before we start to panic and, you know, think that the sky is falling. This is Notre Dame's in a great position right now. And they're obviously not going to hire the offensive line coach before they hire the offensive coordinator. And the offensive coordinator is going to have a say in who that offensive line coach is. And there are a ton of great candidates for offensive line. So, and also, and you mentioned the fact that it was the Tuesday after the Super Bowl when they announced Al Golden and that whole thing. You gotta remember they they were without a defensive coordinator from uh what December 10th until the Tuesday after the Super Bowl. Yeah, so that's right. We're talk we're talking two months. That's right. We're talking two months, and right now we're talking 10 days. So there's a big difference. And this is all gonna be settled sooner than later, and we'll all have something to say, I'm sure, when it's all done. Yes. By the way, as we always ask, Smash that like button, if you would, to help out the Irish Breakdown channel. Subscribe, rate, and review. Leave us a five-star comment on your podcast platforms. And, you know, all that said, there is still nothing that is a done deal with Andy Ludwig. Because, again, there's an offer out there, but there's no there's no deal right. that we know of that is imminent. It's just waiting. Is he going to accept this or not? And, you know, it, it, does, it does change the conversation very quickly if – there's not an acceptance and you do now do now have to move on to the next person. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cause it also changes potentially your offensive line coach search as well. And you have to wait on that even longer. No doubt. Cause they're going to do one before the other guaranteed. I mean, they're not going to bring in an offensive line coach before they knew who the offensive coordinator is going to be. So yeah, I mean, it just, if one is delayed, it's going to delay the other. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's, let's talk about Harry. He and that loss a little bit um, because again, like we talked about the new offensive coordinator, as you would expect the head coach and the offensive coordinator are going to have, you know, uh, you would hope that there'll be some collaboration. You would think that there'll be some collaboration on this. W what do you think of, you know, not just before the Super Bowl, but just the overall timing of this Harry announces the retirement, the, you know, Notre Dame releases the statement. He wants to spend more time with his kids his son is a reserve uh, offensive lineman at the Air Force Academy. He wants to be able to watch his son play, he said, and, you know, spend more time with the family and, and all that stuff. He's 64 years old, but it it obviously 
seems like if Tommy Reese was going to stay for at least another year, Harry was going to stay yep. for another year. So what do you think about this whole thing? I am kind of surprised by that whole – number one, the timing is weird, but it – jives with the fact that he didn't want to have to work with a new offensive coordinator. And when Tommy decided to leave, so did Harry. And I found that interesting. I didn't realize that the two of them were so tight. I I didn't, I I had no idea that they were so tight. I really didn't. And it's not on that level. I mean, I knew that Tommy had something to do, you know, and Brian Kelly leaving and, and the, you know, the connection to Tommy had something to do with Harry coming back, but, like you said, not to that extent. Yeah, that he's like, I will not work with anybody else. Like that, that, that is surprising to me. It's also surprising to me based on who they have in that room, <clears throat> as far as the players and where they're at, and 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 what it looks like. I just, I'm not enthusiastic about it. I'm a little disappointed in you know Harry and and his decision. Obviously, look, I I am not going to give a guy a hard time who wants to spend more time with his family, but it feels to me like that's not the real reason that he's getting out. I mean, he so. literally just spent like three years with his family. He right. came out of retirement for one year. He did nothing for, I, I right. believe it was three years after, you know, being let go by the Chicago bears and he wasn't coaching for three and they were living here in town. So he yeah. had all that, you know, got to watch his son play high school football and all that yeah. different stuff. And and it's disappointing, you know, man. I mean, gotta watch his daughter play basketball. If, you know, she played basketball for St. Joe and all that. It's it's so. flat out disappointing. Yeah, to be honest, it's flat out disappointing. <clears throat> I I will always respect Harry as a coach. I will because I think he's a really really good offensive line coach. He sets the standard. He's a Joe Moore Award winner, right? He's a really good coach. But it's disappointing leaving now at this point because you don't want to work with a new offensive coordinator. At least wait to find out who it is. Yeah. I, I mean, he was he he was signed, sealed, delivered when he heard Tommy was leaving. He didn't care who the next guy was going to be. Didn't matter. I'm out. And Marcus Freeman tried to convince him to stick around. I mean, I know those conversations were had. He's like, nope, I'm out. Okay. I, I It just, <clears throat> it's a very weird scenario. It's going to be interesting to see who Notre Dame goes and gets. But from a specific Harry He standpoint of view, it's just strange, and I don't like it. No, I completely agree. You know, because again, it's like you're you're already, you know, you're within a month of spring practice starting, and you know, I realize they have to have an offensive coordinator in place beforehand, but still, it's like you had every intention of sticking around and to come out of retirement, do all that work. It may, I don't know. Maybe he just wasn't enjoying it anymore. He's 64 years old, which isn't that long, but at the same time, he's been in coaching for 40 years, That's you know, and time. he's done it both at the pro and, and college level. So maybe <laughs> I, I just, it just seems odd that, that Tommy Reese was that much the pull yeah. to get Harry back in. Yeah. And like, that was, that was, you know, he was his reason for sticking around it, it 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 seems very especially for someone who is as good at what he does you know like people talk about well he doesn't you know he's not into the recruiting mm-hmm. and all that stuff well, well harry knew who to recruit you know he exactly. might not have been into it but he knew he he knew the kind of guys he wanted to go after he no. would go out he would get his guys and then once he got here he would develop them and so to me you're right there are a lot of good offensive line coaches but you know, as as we saw the last time Harry left when he went to the Chicago Bears. Well, you can say you're an offensive line coach, but that doesn't mean you're a good offensive line coach. And the problem is Harry is the standard, especially for college offensive line coaches. Might not have worked out in the NFL, but he is really great, not just good, but great at developing yeah. these guys. And obviously all you have to do is is look at who's been all pro in the NFL and and see who his his tutor, you know, or who his uh pupils were and yeah. you know you you can see it on display and you know that helps him recruit as well. And so there's there's going to be some kind of drop off. You can still get a really good one. You can still get a good one, but you're not going to have Harry He stand and you know Marcus Freeman wants this program to be built on those lines we know that there's already you know foundational issues on the other side of the ball with the line and 
this needed to be one that you didn't have to think about, that you could just right. get those guys and you knew what you had. You know, and that's obviously why Marcus wanted Harry to go. So it's going to be a loss. How big a loss, I guess, is is going to be a question. Well, that's one of the points that I made on Saturday was, okay, if Andy Ludwig is the guy, he's literally coached wide receivers, tight ends, running backs, and quarterbacks. The only thing he hasn't coached is offensive linemen. Doesn't matter. Harry, he stands there. Well, now it matters because I don't know who the offensive line coach is going to be. And I'm not saying that Ludwig still won't be very, very good at his job if he ends up getting it, but that's a huge question mark now. I mean, offensive line coach, in my opinion, if I was putting together a staff, that's one of the most important positions that I want. <laughs> You've got to be able to coach the offensive line. They have to be a staple to your program. Whether you want to be a running team, a throwing team, you have to be good up front. You're only as good as your as your two lines. And offensive line is critical and crucial to what you want to do as an offense. You can have all the scheme in the world, but if your offensive line is terrible, you're in trouble. Now, there's a ton of talent there, but there's still a big question mark as to who's going to coach that talent up. And so this, I don't want to say this is a bigger hire than the OC because it's not, but man, it's right up there. Like if you- It's very important. I mean, it's- If I was going to put importance so level, importance level to all the offensive coaches- it's OC, it's offensive line, one, two, one, a one B, you know, and those are the two that are, they're trying to replace. So th that's, that's massive. It's massive. Tim says Utah had a pretty physical O line. I think he can figure it out. Well, if he brings his offensive line coach, that's with if him. he brings it. Yeah. And that's, again, it's not a done deal. Cause you know, one, it has to be Ludwig. You know, and again, we know he's got an offer, but he, you know, there's been no acceptance that we know right. of yet. But two, if Ludwig does come here, then his offensive line coach is thought to be a potential candidate for the offensive coordinator job out there at Utah. Because right. I think he's, dominoes. I think he's an associate head coach or an assistant head coach. You know, one of those kind of titles sure. already. You know, so he's got that kind of, you know, almost like a, a coach in waiting, type of thing. Makes sense. So. Yeah, I mean, so it's not a done deal, I don't think, that that he would bring him. You know, if he could, that would be great. And, you know, Absolutely. you you know, I looked, you know, Harding, he's he's produced some offensive linemen to the NFL out there. And it is, you know, I, I think one knock on Ludwig has been the recruiting. And, I mean, Notre Dame versus Utah, who do you expect to recruit better? It's you know? A no brainer, yeah. Exactly. Because even – even Utah in the Pac-12, it's still like, it's really kind of hard to believe. I think it's been like 11 or 12 years Utah's been in the Pac-12. But it, it they've really, since joining that conference, have only been more relevant in the conference conversation out there recently. And they're still kind of like the off-brand. You know, they came from the Mountain West and all that kind of. They're still like the off-brand when it comes to the Pac-12, I think. so. Should you, you know, again, should you be able to recruit better when you come to Notre Dame? Yeah, right. and, you know, that goes for the coordinator and the offensive line coach. So, you know, so maybe that does help. I, I get, but again, like, like, what do you think of Chris Watt? Let me just throw that name out there because that's a name that's been bounced around a little bit and he's obviously connected to Harry. Sure. I mean, he was in theory, the heir apparent, you know, uh, he, he, he stopped being, the offensive line coach at Tulane to come and be a graduate assistant again at Notre Dame when Harry came back. <clears throat> that tells you a little bit of something in my opinion, right? And so you would think that that would be the case if Harry left on better terms, I think, or if there wasn't this hole at offensive coordinator. I think the timing is not good for Chris Watt, if I'm being honest. I, I don't, this is the worst case scenario, in my opinion, for Chris, Chris Watt to get this job, them having to hire an offensive line coach and uh, Harry leaving the way that he did. Like It's a kind of a perfect storm of not good uh, for Chris Watt. It felt to me like it needed to be a smoother transition if Chris Watt was going to be the offensive line coach. Maybe another year or two under Harry. Yeah. You, know, you do this in early January. Like It just... it. I don't know. It it wouldn't 
it would have been like a co-announcement. It would have been like, hey, Harry Stand is retiring and Chris Watts taking over. And Chris Watts taking the job, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And when that didn't happen, because I read the thing thinking, oh, are they just going to name Chris Watts as the offensive line coach? And they didn't. That you know, His name was never mentioned. And so I, I think he's a good coach based on everything that I know that he did behind the scenes when he was the graduate assistant here after Harry left. I think he's a good, so I think he's a good coach. I think he has a good rapport with the players, all of those different things. I just don't know that it, it's the right timing for him right now. I just don't. If they're not going to name him right away, I don't know if they're going to name him, but we'll see. Maybe he still has an opportunity. He'll he'll be a candidate, I think. Hopefully so. I'd, I'll be interested to see where that goes. Brent says, Jeff Quinn recruited very well, and I don't know if, if he means that like earnestly or if he's, you know, there's some sarcasm that comes along with it because Quinn did recruit very well, but as a as a uh, technician of the game, a teacher of the position, he was very poor. Fundamentals, sure. yes, were lacking. You know, I mean, basically the fact that he recruited well at least made up to some extent, you know, to the fact that he wasn't nearly as good a coach as Harry Heastan. Right, and Notre Dame paid the price for it. I mean, that's that's why they had the offensive, you know, the the the, the level of play of the offensive line last year. You can you, you know? can recruit as well as you want, but if you can't coach them up, it doesn't matter. Right. And that that that's I guess that's my pushback on that. Yeah, he wasn't a terrible recruiter. He was fine. He did he did a good job. He also had the Notre Dame brand of offensive linemen and offensive line O O line U in his back pocket. That makes it a little bit easier. Okay. Couldn't coach them. Like they were so fundamentally unsound that it doesn't matter who you bring in. You've got to coach them because an 18 year old kid coming in from high school has to be developed to become a 23 year old who can be a championship level player. Right. And and people weren't getting there. They weren't getting there. Yeah. As Tommy said, he recruited well, too many guards. And that's true. Yeah. As well, and that's you know we've talked about the difference between the Quinn recruiting philosophy and the Heastan, and I I much prefer the way Heastan would oh, do yeah. it: go out and recruit tackles, and then get them on campus, figure out okay which one's actually going to be a tackle, which one's going to be a guard, maybe one of them ends up being a center, that kind of thing. He didn't really recruit interior linemen; he recruited right. you know the better better athletes and you know bodies that can fill out a little bit more, a little longer and leaner, and that kind of stuff typically with the tackles and then get them on the campus, get them in that weight program and, and, you know, turn the ones that are maybe a little slower footed into guards and they ended up still being really good guards. Right. Absolutely. I much and prefer I, that to, to recruiting, you know, right. a little bit smaller, stockier, probably interior lineman out of high school. I do want to, I, I, I don't want to put words in Matt's mouth. He says no more good recruiter, poor coach, poor or poor recruiter, good coach. We need them to be both period. If you're referring to Harry Heastan, he was not a poor recruiter. That I, We have pushed back on this, and we pushed back on this, and we pushed back on this. He's not right. a poor recruiter. He's a guy who doesn't necessarily want to be on the road all the time, but he was able to pick out who he wanted, and he got them. That doesn't mean you're a poor recruiter. Right. You you get the guys you want, and then you sit back and you watch everybody else flounder. Like, I don't... He was just... Yeah, he, he, he just... <laughs> he had a very specific way that he did his yeah. recruiting and he, you know look at the look at the class that he got he he got the guys he wanted by and large okay all right matt yeah there that's you go. his okay, okay. thanks Correct. Matt. i appreciate talking that. talking about quinn not harry okay okay fair enough just to clarify because the way you worded it made it sound like you know right. was, you know yeah for sure yep i appreciate that matt very much so and, and harry's gonna be missed i mean look the way he went out i don't agree with it i'm not happy about it but he's gonna be missed as a coach and some I saw somebody say, you know, we shouldn't be talking all this good stuff about Harry with the way the line performed at the beginning of the season. Okay, I I get it. They didn't perform very well, but man, did he have his work cut out for him, having to break these guys down and, well, that's and exactly build them it. back up. That's exactly it. Harry was very specific, like because when you heard guys after Harry was gone talk about the difference in in Quinn to Harry, you heard guys say stuff like, well. You know, Harry was like, there's a very specific way 
that you were, you know, like you were going to go from point A to point B. You need to do this, you know, like with technical, whether it's the footwork, the hands, whatever it happens to be. There's a very specific way that you need to do that. And it was, it, it's basically the fundamentals, the incremental fundamentals right. of how you get there. It's, you know, and like you can apply some of this to Mike Elston back in 2017 when he moved back to defensive line coach from linebackers when Elko took over. Like we sat there all spring watching and watching, you know, like Elko and Elston, you know, working with these. And it's like nothing that we saw in the spring said this is going to be a drastically improved defense from right. 2016 to 2017. But when they got there on the field, we saw it. Now with Harry Heastan, you know, again, it's like, Again, his he had a very specific way, and you you did things in a very specific way, and 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 that very specific way gave results at the end of the day. Jeff Quinn was much more loose with oh, those yeah. kind of things, much less focus on those minute details of how to get to point A to point B. It's just like, okay, this this guy needs to go there. I don't care how you do it. That that was never going to fly in Harry's world. And again. Look at look at who had the better results in terms of you know, and so it 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 took Harry a little bit of time. One with the fact that you had new guys playing, you know, some of the guys, some of the names were the same, but playing in different positions than last year. One and two, it was like he was coming back in and still building all of this up. So it took a little bit more time. Than I think any of them thought it was going to, but by the time it was all said and done, it was a really good offensive line that I think with another year under Harry with, you know, what they had coming back probably would have been a Joe Moore ward contender. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Season. absolutely. And it still could be, but for right now it's, there's, there's a blank space there right next to who, you know, on, on that door, whoever's going to go in that door. And you know, like Tim says, as an experienced coach, Ludwig should know what he needs in a good O-line coach. He doesn't have to bring his O-line guy with him. And that's true. But again, Brian Kelly was a very experienced coach, and he hired Jeff Quinn. So for me, it's just like, again, when you've got the standard bearer, no matter who you're going to hire, and, it, and especially if you're bringing in somebody from the outside and now you're trusting him with it, we just don't know what that's going to end up looking like. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time to find out. Yeah, it is. And and just because you know what you need doesn't mean the guy you hire has that too. I mean, it, look, if he if he is able to bring his offensive line coach with him from Utah, um obviously speaking about Jim Harding, I mean, that's a mass that's a home that's a grand slam if you put the two together because he's been a co-offensive coordinator, he's been the the uh, what, the assistant head coach since 2017. I mean, he's got leadership. He's he's put guys in the NFL. The problem is he's been at Utah for nine years. That's a long time to be at one place to pick up and leave. And so that's going to be tough. And like you said, he might be in line to be the next offensive coordinator. He was already the co-offensive coordinator in 15 and 16. And now he might have an opportunity to be the lone, the lone wolf. And uh, obviously that comes with a pay raise and he doesn't have to move his family. So, you know, I don't know what his family looks like. I haven't looked that far you know, into who he is and, and, and whatnot. He's got two sons. It doesn't say how old they are, but I mean, look, they're probably still in school. It looks like he's two years older than me. Although I have to say, I think I've aged better than him. <laughs> it's got a lot more gray hair, but yeah. uh, <laughs> I was surprised to see he was born in 1978, but either way, he's, that would be a home run if you can get him to come with, but it's going to be tough. That's not going to be an easy sell. And maybe that's what Ludwig is is waiting on. Maybe he's trying to convince Harding to come with him. He might be. We don't know. I, that's pure speculation on my part. Pure speculation. Right. But, you know, you never know. But again, you know, if you've been coaching for that long, as long as Harding has, and you're in position to be a coordinator, you know, that's that's a step up. Right. You know, like it, it's a bigger step up than leaving for the same job to work for the same guy, even at a more ho high profile school. Right. You know, so it's it's a longer path if he wants to ultimately be a coordinator and potentially a head coach at some point. You Absolutely. Know? And yep. for an offensive line coach, that's like. I don't know it doesn't seem like you see a lot of offensive line coaches become head coaches they're kind of like their own breed 
That's, like most of them tend to just be line coaches. They're happy career, just doing that. You know? Driving the yeah. Ford F-150 back and forth to, to school and, you know, just wearing the big pullover jacket and being an offensive line coach. Like there's, they're, they're all built the same, man. I, I tell you what, they're all built the same. So it is what it oh, is. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So, you know, again, it's, it's, um, it's out there, the Andy Ludwig thing. Yeah. We're, we're kind of waiting and, and seeing, and, and, you know, and, and I get it, you know, people are saying there are a lot of good offensive line coaches out there and you're absolutely right. But again, <laughs> like if you're going from Tom Brady to Mac Jones, like Mac Jones was a first round draft pick, Mac, you know, Tom Brady wasn't like theoretically yeah, true. Mac Jones should have been a good, you know, so it's, there's, there's still a drop off. Yep. Right. No and, doubt. There are just no guarantees. Finding the right guy. It, it, I guess the one thing that does kind of work in, in Ludwig's favor in this whole thing, though, is the fact that he has, you know, kind of moved around, worked at some different places. So he's worked with some some different guys and he's going to have, connect, you know, other connections as well. So he knows a lot of people. So, again, assuming it's it's him. Do I think he can make the right choice? Of course, because he knows what he needs for that offense and 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 he's been running that offense for quite some time yep absolutely agree well vince we've got more of this in rapid fire do you want to go ahead and do it we might as well let's All go right. baby rapid we've fire lot, we've got a lot in rapid fire tonight whether it's notre dame super bowl oh so much good stuff to talk about with the super bowl <laughs> whatever it happens to be so fill in the blank it would be blank if Ludwig is named Notre Dame's offensive coordinator. Best case scenario, home run hire. You know, however you want to, whatever whatever phrase you want to put in there that's like super positive, that's what it is. Uh, he, he was in my top tier to begin with. I think his offense is, is perfect for what Notre Dame has on their roster. He's able to adapt. He... God, he made Cam Rising look good. So <laughs> if that's... If that's the case, he could do wonders with quarterbacks. So uh, I, I think that's just an absolute home run hire if they can make this happen. Yeah, and to me, I completely agree with that, where they are at this point, because when I look, you know, go back and kind of looked at some stuff for the last couple of years, I wasn't overly thrilled with, you know, the, the amount of 12 personnel, 13 personnel, yeah. and that kind of stuff. But the more you dig through Ludwig's, background you know he's been at some different places coach for different head coaches and in, in different styles and, and run his offense in different ways and the biggest thing is he is what I think Marcus Freeman is looking for he has the ability to cater to what he has on the roster he's used running yep. backs before he likes to throw the ball to yep. running backs and he's also had you know like talking about that offensive line and, and running backs he's also had a lot of running backs go over a thousand yards in his career. And more importantly than that, one of the biggest things that I talked about when we were talking about it last week, what needed to be a top priority for this guy is being a guy who can develop quarterbacks. And you brought sure. up Cam Rising and, you know, he worked with Brian Johnson, you know, a guy who was rumored to be in the running for this thing. But Brian Johnson was the quarterback who beat Alabama. You know, yeah. who mentioned that last week, you know, so like he's that's 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 big. So when when you look at those things, I think that this would be a really good hire. I had him in that top tier along with you and we talked about it last week. So if it ends up being him, I think it would be a really good hire for Notre Dame, a guy who has the ability to uh, to be very flexible and cater to the strengths of of what's on the roster. Well, and and he has the check marked box of being a seasoned offensive coordinator he he's done this before and he's done it for a long time he knows what he's doing we're not having <clears throat> we're not bringing in a guy with a high ceiling this guy's got a tremendously high floor as well as a high ceiling like this he's a guy that we know knows what he's doing i i, I mean and i'm not saying that tommy didn't know what he was doing but they hired somebody who had never been an offensive coordinator before a lot more experience a lot this more roster, experience. Yeah, with this mm -hmm. roster, where this team is right now, 
They needed somebody with experience, in my opinion. And if they can nail this down, they're going to get it. And that's awesome. I mean, really, when you, you know, when you go down the boxes, developer of quarterbacks, play caller, experience, you know, the ability, you know, again, to, to, to cater to the strengths of, of what you have on the roster, you know, to, to do different things. Like he checks just about every box. The only thing that you could knock him on is the recruiting rankings. But again, if you're going to compare recruiting rankings of Notre Dame and Utah, yeah, that's... And, and again, like other places he's worked at, like Vanderbilt and Cal and Fresno, like there is no comparison there. So well, I, I think I think like a lot of other guys, you can become a much better recruiter just by being at Notre Dame. And he offered a bunch of guys that are currently on Notre Dame's roster, right? You know, including Good Tyler point. Buckner and you know uh, Merriweather, and I mean a bunch of guys he offered. Like he, those are the guys he wants in his offense. And now he can walk in the door and have them on his offense like that. What an awesome situation to potentially be in if you're him. Yeah, Joe wants to know if money will be a sticking point, and. No. I don't think so. Not based. Didn't mean to jump over you. I apologize. No, that's, go ahead. I don't think so at all because I think starting with the hiring of Marcus Freeman, money has not been an issue at Notre Dame. Like that is an old argument. That argument doesn't hold water anymore. The, you know, there was the report out there that said Notre Dame was pretty much going to match whatever Alabama wanted to pay Tommy Reese. That was an accurate report as far as I know from the people I've talked to. And so – I don't think money's an issue anymore at Notre Dame as far as retaining coaches and hiring coaches. It's not a thing. So I, I don't think that's an issue. Yeah. I mean, you, you might not get what a, what a coordinator in the SEC is going to get, but you know, like compared to, to the PAC 12, I, w- I wouldn't think it's going to be right. a big issue again, especially for somebody with the experience that this guy's got, but who knows? They could be negotiating some things behind the scenes right now that could be part of it as well fill in the blank harry he stand announcing his retirement 20 minutes before the super bowl kicked off is blank it's odd i'll just say that it's odd especially since we find out later like brian kind of knew this was going to happen on friday and we're all sitting there getting ready for the super bowl and having to deal with that kind of news like it felt like a dump it felt like a news dump you know like the friday Big news to them. Like the Friday afternoon thing, you know what I mean? Like, then you got the weekend and the news cycle and all that. Like, it felt like a news dump. Nobody's paying attention to Notre Dame football. We're what? We're getting ready to watch the the, the Super Bowl. Like, it was the, the timing of it was terrible, frankly. And I'm reading way too much into this, but in my head, it felt like you know what? Screw you, Harry. We're gonna announce this when nobody's paying attention. <laughs> As opposed to... So you think they did it. You don't think it was Harry was like, let's do it now. I don't. I I don't think he had any control over when it was dropped because he informed the team like a week ago. I mean, why wouldn't you drop it in the middle of the Super Bowl if you're going to do it, you know, on Super Bowl Sunday? Do I it. think you stay away from the day completely. Like, it, it's just well, so stupid. there's that. It just seems very odd, you know, like... They did, you know, it was defensive players that we talked with on Friday. And, you know, we we got to do that. That had been pushed back and they changed it around and stuff like that. You've got all day Saturday. There's nothing going on on Saturday. You're into nothing. the weekend already. Just like another Notre Dame basketball loss. To do it 20 minutes before the Super Bowl, you know, because then it's like, you know, like people like who had some idea it was going to happen. Well, at least they've you know, got some stories prepared and that, you know, they're, they're ready to go. But, you know, like a lot of people are at Super Bowl parties and, you know, kicking back and, and doing their own thing. You know, you talk about spending time with your family and all that kind of stuff. It's like other people are doing their own things. It's 20 minutes before the, the Super Bowl kicked off. It just, what an odd time to do. And it's it, like, like to me, like you said, you think it, it's more from the Notre Dame perspective. Like it would be very fitting though with an offensive lineman just kind of like trying to blend in yeah, you know, fair high, enough. know like like you said dump it before the super bowl nobody's going to pay attention nobody's going to talk about it but here we are it's just weird the whole thing was just strange and it was weird and it didn't feel to me like the announcement of a guy going into retirement after coaching for 40 years you know what i mean like it just didn't feel that way with with the amount of hype that Notre Dame had about Ian Book and the Super Bowl, and how many times we got to hear about that, 
to drop this Harry he stand information 20 minutes before kickoff is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I'm so glad we don't have to hear that anymore. And I guess oh. if you're Notre Dame, you know, there's some benefit in telling quarterback recruits, is look, there? we've got a guy playing, you know, he's not playing in the Super Bowl. He wasn't oh. even like – I was looking for him. They didn't do very many sideline pan shots. It's like you never even saw him in the background, but he was nope. not in uniform. He was wearing sweats. He didn't get to suit up. He's the third quarterback. Right. They, they made it sound like he was freaking Joe Montana out there, ready to ready to run out there on the field for the Eagles. Come on. Just the one post that they made, and I know you don't want to talk about this, but I'm talking about it. <laughs> the one post that Go they ahead. made with like his his like face that was like drawn and it's like good luck ian book in the super bowl and like what good luck don't trip over the stairs when you're getting to your seat like hey, good luck what are we what what is this what are you I, talking I, about i should find i should find and the, the answer is no matt he no. did not dress because practice squad quarterbacks do not dress in playoff he, they right. don't they rarely dress during the regular season if at all he spent most of the times that I did see him during the regular season. Again, he's wearing a warm up suit because he's the practice squad quarterback. Right. That's what he is. It's Jalen Hurts, Gardner Minshew, Ian Book. The number three quarterback does not dress in playoff games in the NFL because they only have 43 men on the roster, on the active roster. Yeah. Just, they don't allow emergency quarterbacks and all that kind of stuff. Right. Which is why the 49ers were screwed in the NFC championship. Right. I mean, Let's be honest. Oh, here we go. Uh, it, it's on. It was on Facebook. That's where I saw it. And it. And I don't mean to disparage anybody over at Notre Dame, but whoever drew this self, this portrait of Ian. Oh, I know the picture you're talking about. I know the picture oh, you're talking. Oh about. my! It's not good. It looks almost like a caricature. I, <laughs> maybe that's what they were going for. I don't know. But they, it's just a picture of Ian Book. And it says Eagles versus Chiefs. Ian Book Super Bowl Fifty Seven Six Thirty on Fox. No, you could have picked any person that was in the stadium and put their picture there, and he would have the could same the same guy. Effect That's right on the outcome of that game. I look, I respect him. He's on an NFL roster. Absolutely. That's awesome. If he had one, he would have a Super Bowl ring for the rest of his life. Hundred percent. But to hype him like he was playing in the game was just ridiculous. that's the problem. That's the problem. I yeah. I give him all the respect in the world. He's still playing the game and getting paid to do it. Okay, hey, that's awesome. I saw where uh, Chad Henney, you know, he announced his retirement after the game. I the Chiefs that, yeah. backup quarterback. He played 15 years and made $40 million as a, basically a career backup quarterback yep. in the NFL. Now, he was more than a backup early in his career. But, you know, the length, you know, the bulk of his career was spent as a backup. And he made a ton of money doing it, Who, which is who's... awesome. Who's the kid from Missouri uh, who who's just, uh, who's just um, making all Chase, kinds of money? Um, in back? Daniel. Chase, Chase Daniel. Daniel. Yeah. Isn't it him? Didn't he yeah. make like just a boatload of money? He's still doing it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, career earning. That comes up in a Google search like immediately. All I got to do is type in his name. He Okay. He's made over $41 million as a backup, which translates to $230,000 per completed pass. In wow. his career, two hundred thirty thousand dollars per completed pass, Sean. Where do I sign up for that? Take it if you can get it. And and I exactly more power to him. Good for you, dude. You life changing money for your family by holding a clipboard. Good for you, man. Yeah, that's awesome. By the way, do you do Super Bowl parties? Have you ever like? I have never hosted. I have attended a few over the years. Not recently. Yeah, not recently. I have always been more like, especially, you know, doing radio, having to talk about the game, having right. done as many of the parties and stuff like that, but, and definitely have not recently either. Yeah. So the whole party thing for football and the Super Bowl and Notre Dame, like every once in a blue moon, I'll go to like an away game, get together for Notre right. Dame, you know, with people. But it turns out like I'm the one sitting on the couch trying to pay attention to the game. Everybody else is drinking, having a good time, doing their thing. Like, I yeah. can't do that. I, that's I, right. I have to be focused. And I, and I love my buddies who I was able to hang out with last year for one of the away games. It was fun. I enjoyed it. But I just felt like I was kind of a stick in the mud because I was over there 
watching the game and having to pay like close attention to what was going on. And same thing with the Super Bowl. And I know I'm going to sound like one of the old men in the balcony, but it just goes on too freaking late. And I don't want to be over at somebody else's house and have to drive home at that time. I'm sorry. I hear you. I hear you. Pretty much in the same boat. Yeah. Fill in the blank. Super Bowl 57 was blank. It's a great game. I, I enjoyed it. I had a little, little, little itty bitty money on the, on the game, you know, here and there. And so like, it was fun kind of tracking that, but it was a competitive game. Right? The the Chiefs were down 10. They came back. It's a tie game. All of that. It was an entertaining game. You can't ask for much more in the Super Bowl. And I was very entertained by the game. Yeah, I I thought so as well. I mean, it did get a little dull from time to time just watching Philly ground, you know, grind out possessions. And true. But I mean, it's part of their game. It's like, I worry about. I don't know how actual worried I am. I just wonder about Jalen Hurts with that style, you know, because like everyone talks about going for it and the, you know, the running and all that different stuff. And he is, you know, at least built a little bit differently, maybe a little bit thicker than most of the the quarterbacks who run quite a bit. I just, I just wonder how long that guy can stay healthy, but, but that's fair as to the game itself. I mean, it was. It was a great game. It had everything you want. Like you said, it 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 had it had big offensive plays. You know, Hurts throwing balls yeah. downfield. You know, they great. You know, to Devonte Smith and Man. and to uh, AJ Brown. And, you know, all you know, all this different stuff. And it was really, you know, we we got so used to seeing the Chiefs' offense with Tyreek Hill over the last few years being the big explosive downfield offense, and they really figured out how to, to maximize their possessions. They didn't punt in the second half. They they turned it into points. Yeah. You had arguably the best quarterback going right now, Patrick Mahomes running the whole thing. The, the Really, the biggest drawback to me was the grass, you know, like all the oh, slipping terrible. up there on the field. And I saw apparently they spent two years growing that grass on a sod farm. They started off in Phoenix. They installed it in the stadium two weeks ago. And they would, they had like this retractable right. floor. They would like set it out in the sun in the morning, yep. you know, to give it sun. And then they would bring it back in and all this different stuff. But this, that, that grass, that sod was terrible. That was, that was the worst part of the whole thing. They're lucky nobody got hurt last night on that stuff. When we went to the Fiesta Bowl last year, obviously it was different sod, but same stadium, the whole thing. <clears throat> the grass was so incredibly short, like, <clears throat> like first level of rough short. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Just like you've got the fairway and then just a little bit like that's what it was. And it, it, and it surprised me at the time. And I'm wondering if it was similar to that, just newer, right? I could see how they slip all over the place. It was like linoleum, man. Like it was so incredibly short. There was nothing to grab onto with your cleats. And then it was ripping up and there was right. chunks and it was a very, very disappointing thing for me since this is the Super Bowl. This is your epic moment as the NFL, right? And you've got a playing surface that nobody could stand up on. Like that's a fail for the NFL. That's a fail. Yeah. Michael says they should have used the same field the Cardinals did. And one of the Chiefs was asked about the grass after the game and they the chiefs played in arizona during the regular season Bad he said too. the field that the cardinals used was even worse yeah than what we saw last night yep yep and remember just, kyler murray got hurt on that right so bad it was just a bad bad look i yeah. mean with all the technology that we have you're in arizona like how does how is the turf a problem i know it's bad i know we've been really lucky though like when you think about it because i grew up with some stinker Super Bowls, especially in the 80s, you know, like when the Broncos were getting their butts kicked all the time and like Washington got spanked by the Raiders one time, you know, sure. there were there were a lot of different, blow, you know, like the Cowboys blowing up Buffalo and, you know, all those different things in the 90s. Like there were a lot of bad Super Bowls for a long time. We've been really lucky that there have only been a handful of really stinkers in the last 25 or so years. We've, we've had at least... You know, some games have been more boring than others, I guess. You know, there was one a couple of years ago. But for the most part, yeah. like, these have been very competitive games. Yeah. Know? So. Yeah, was, no, I, I enjoyed it. going on last night? 
<clears throat> I enjoyed the actual game itself, the actual football game itself. I enjoyed it. Yeah. All right, we're going to get to the big one of the night. I, I have right. no idea where we're going to stand on this, like from each other. But do you buy or sell the defensive holding call on the Eagles near the end of the game on third and eight last night? I know this is not going to be a popular take, and I don't care. It was a penalty. It got called. Can you not hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. So I, I, okay. So I know this is not a popular take, but I think it was a penalty. And if it's a penalty in the first or second quarter, it's a penalty in the fourth quarter. You call it. I have no problem with them calling it. I'm happy that they called it. And I, I do not subscribe to the theory that it ruined the Super Bowl. I'm sorry. And it was uh, it was not good. It was not good at all. John, I think you're gonna have to go out and come back in. It's making that noise. All right, so I'm gonna throw it to the chat because I'm very curious as to what the chat thinks about the call. I think it was a good call. He literally held him, and the Eagles guy at the end of the game when he was being interviewed, he's like, "Yeah, I tu I tugged on his shoulder or I tugged on his jersey." That's holding. That's holding. I'm sorry. It's a penalty. It's holding. Let's see here. Let's see what we got here. Brent says, let him play. You can let him play, but let him play when it's legal. So, you know, there's that. Welcome back. Thank you. I I'll you probably have to get this in. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Well, I'll probably have to get this in quickly because the last time I had this issue, it kept reoccurring. So, my point on this is, if your argument is, well, yeah, you know, it's a penalty, but you can't call it in that situation, which I, it looks like you were just talking about there for a second. I'm sorry. We're just going to have to agree to disagree on that. You cannot ignore a penalty because of when it happened right. or, you know, exactly. they, you know, they weren't calling it all game or, you know, whatever, any of that kind of stuff. Like, like, did they ignore you know, um, D Ford's offsides in the AFC championship game? you know, when the Chiefs were playing the Patriots because it happened with a minute in the game? Like, like who decides which penalties we decide to ignore? They're, they're always going to call offsides and false starts and all that stuff. Aren't those just as much of, of a penalty as defensive holding? Right. And, you know, like the biggest thing to me in that specific case, and I think maybe the official was thinking along these lines as well, based on when the flag was thrown, like, when you look at, you know, was it a slight hold? Yeah, it was a slight hold. But Bradbury, the guy, you know, the defensive back admitted James Bradbury. He said, yeah, I grabbed him. I thought that maybe I could get away with it, but he didn't. And the fact that he grabbed him and where that ball landed and where Schuster was when that ball landed, if he's not grabbed, that's probably a touchdown. It impacted the play. And that's yes. the biggest thing to me. And that's what I think the official was looking at. He kind of, he kind of waited, I think, to see you know, what the end of the play looked like. And then he threw it because again, like Schuster was not that far away, like probably within what, five or six yards yeah. of the ball when it hit. And when you're held like that and a professional athlete who can move at four, three, he's going to catch that ball. If he's not held at the line of scrimmage, I'm sorry. So Bradbury impacted the play. You can't just ignore it because of the situation in the game. I'm sorry. I just completely disagree with that line of thinking. Yep, could not agree more. And somebody put like a side-by-side -side of, I think it was the second quarter when it looked like uh, Smith-Schuster got got held earlier in the game when he was right. going across. And they didn't get the but, call on that one. But here's the difference. Mahomes didn't throw the ball to him on that play. He threw to a completely different receiver. Refs are looking a completely different direction. On the, on the play where it was called, the ball was going to him. Refs are looking. Like, it, it was just... You, those are apples to oranges, right? In my opinion. Yes. One was holding. It didn't get called. One was holding. It did get called. Right. Okay. I, I agree with that. That's fine. But man, let's be honest here. If he doesn't hold him, it's a touchdown. Like, just like you said, you have to call that penalty. I don't care that it was at the end of the game. It doesn't matter. You have to call it. So again, I didn't have a dog in the fight. So I'm looking at this completely in a neutral, you know, <laughs> standpoint. Right. Yeah. You call it. 
You call it. It's defensive holding. Right. And I mean, you know, look at look at the Philadelphia Eagles right tackle, you know, all night long. Yeah. Like, and he's he's done that all season. And, you know, trust me, and anyone, you know, who's who's watched that all season long, like Lane Johnson, like, has he ever been flagged for going early? But well, and when they he's like right slowed there. it down and they like pinpointed it and they're like, oh, he's just just great time. He's no. just really good. He was early. It's like Mishawaka's offensive lineman. No, they're <laughs> That's early. Right. They're right. early. Like, just because they do it the same way the whole game doesn't mean they're not early. He was early. They're early. It's a penalty, but you know, they guess I guess they decided that's not one. I don't know. Yeah. And you know, I just hate the whole the refs shouldn't determine the outcome of the game. The refs don't. The, the, if the player commits the penalty, I don't care how much time is left on the clock. Bradbury determined the outcome by committing the penalty. The referee just enforced the penalty. And I just Right. You know, we're we're going to get into the announcer thing here in a minute. Greg Ols, well, we'll just go ahead and and I'll just say this though first because a lot of people, oh, the NFL is rigged and all that stuff. A Cowboys a Cowboys writer tweeted today, if the NFL is rigged, uh the NF you would think that they would put the Dallas Cowboys in the <laughs> Super Bowl every now and then. <laughs> it's not wrong. You know, it's like what benefit is it, you know, okay, so but Patrick Mahomes has another Super Bowl. Like like what benefit is it to the NFL that the Chiefs win the Super Bowl, you know, right. instead Absolutely. of the Eagles? None. 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 Zero. So it was Kevin Burkhart and Greg Olson's first Super Bowl. Could be their only Super Bowl together with Tom Brady waiting in the wings here in a couple of years. What did you think of their call of the game last night? It was a lot of Olson. I heard his voice a lot. Um, that's not necessarily a good thing, but it was just kind of bleh. Like, it was just bleh. Like it didn't, I, you know, I watched the game full volume, the whole thing. I, I don't like announcers don't bother me. Like they do some people. Right. Right. So they were kind of in the background. So they didn't really do anything to grab my attention ever. Like the entire time. So it was just kind of blah. I mean, they weren't bad. They weren't great. They were just kind of there. I don't know. It just, nothing was memorable to me. Yeah, I think they're good, but it I, I'm right there with you. It was it was more like it blended into the background and it it you know like they don't really scream big game crew just yet. And again, a lot of people fawning over Greg Olson. I think he does a fine job. You know, like Burkhart was was there on the action, but you know, appropriate and all that kind of stuff. But like he just, you know, it's like he's a professional announcer and you're right about the Olsen thing like that's one big thing it seems like in their booth is is like Burkhart has no problem like setting Greg Olsen up yeah. and just kind yeah. of letting Olsen go which there's no okay. problem with that in TV because typically in TV the analyst is supposed to be the star you know like yeah. see John Madden and Romo you know whoever else that you know you want to go down the line that's typically how it's set up you know it should be for the analyst you know my biggest problem what I like about Greg Olsen and you know, Jesse and I kind of go back and forth on this. You know, Jesse, you know, hates him because he thinks he's anti-cowboy and all that kind of stuff, whatever. But I think Olsen does a really good job of explaining what's happening on the plays. You know, he knows the rules inside and out. He was really good, like with the Jarek McKinnon, you know, like as McKinnon is running, he's like, he's got to get down. He's got to get down, you know, which I know ticked you off because of where you had some of your money last night. <laughs> but, I mean, he was absolutely right. He needed to get down and stay in bounds. He, he did. did just you know, like yeah. he, he knows game situations. He explains all that stuff really well. But, you know, to me, the biggest thing that annoyed me was like, he gave his opinion on the pass interference call that we just talked about. Right. Which is fine. Like he gave his opinion on what, he thinks it should be. Now it's coming from a former player, of course, you know, and offensive player, offensive player. That's right. But I just felt like, okay, you gave your opinion. They showed the replay, you know, you, you, again, you reiterated your opinion, but then like five or six times later, okay, get off it now. You know, yeah. you don't have to keep hitting that. We, we get it. You disagree with the call. You know, Mike Pereira comes in. He's like, well, it is holding, <laughs> you know, and then they're disagreeing about it after they had, you know, talked about what a real great rules analyst Mike Pereira is, even though, you know, it's like, does it, does it, does it take a genius to figure out when the running back's elbow was down before the goal line? You know, like we need the rules right. 
analyst to come right. in and explain that one to us. Was, and they, yeah. they literally paused it while he's down. Ball's clearly not past the goal line. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, again, like, I think that, that Greg Olson does a good job with all that stuff. But it was just a little bit too much for me at, at the end there with that call. Specifically. Agreed. Agreed. You doing okay over there? You look like you're about to fall apart on me. I'm struggling, man. I, I don't know what it is. I, I got to get some drugs in me. Something. So Over-the-counter drugs, by the way. Just, yes. It's yes. like a head cold. Of course. Of course. Any Super Bowl commercials really stand out to you last night? You know, there was uh, the Alicia Silverstone one. That was good. I enjoyed that one. She's looking good for her age. I'll give her credit. <laughs> The the two dog ones I thought were good. Those were like kind of tear jerk, almost tear jerker moments. You know, they kind of tug at the heartstrings a little bit. Yeah. Uh, the one where the, the the puppy became a dog and he was old. And he, they even gave the dog like gray hair, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, what other ones were there? I the, the baby one. I, I don't know why, but babies talking like adults kind of always gets me in a positive way. I kind of gave a chuckle to that one. So that one was all right. Um, I thought the Will Ferrell uh, one. I chuckled a little bit, you know, like seeing him in it, there were, it's just the commercials aren't near what they, you know, they went, they, they went high shock value until what, maybe five or six years ago. And they've been a lot yeah. more tame. Like, you know, I thought the, the Ben Affleck Duncan commercial, you know, yeah, I got a little chuckle good. out of it. JLo yeah. drives up at the end and, you know, like the very first commercial of the game, I think, you know, and yeah, that was good. Um, He's, grab me a glazed while you're at it. That was yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, like the Bradley Cooper with his mom with the with the t-mobile i don't know yeah, if you remember that was that all right you know? yeah that was all again, right it's like there were some you know like in like the what was it um the hellman's brie and ham and then pete davidson at the end you know i thought you know it was at least somewhat well, you clever. Guys They're just, good. there were you know there were there was nothing great there were just some kind of like Haha, you know kind of chuckles i told you this one yesterday i thought they totally botched the caddyshack bushwood terrible terrible i wasn't like i love caddyshack and like joe is saying if you got it the spoof of, of caddyshack was good i love caddyshack but i, I wasn't impressed with it was a great idea decided to fill the roles i yeah. have no problem with the idea i think the idea is spot on but they botched it complete like tony romo in the bill murray role hello bill murray's still alive That's he's right. literally doing nothing just he would Bill probably do it. He would probably do it. Why? Why Tony Romo? That make no sense to me. Well, and here's what I don't get either: is like why they've started like airing some of these commercials and leaking them before the game. You know, that was always like yeah, good supposed to be part of why you watch the Super Bowl. Like, you know, why you don't go to the kitchen and get your right. stuff because you wanted to be there for the for the great Super Bowl commercials. That's what. I don't, I don't right. get why they started in like they did. I don't think it was the exact same thing, but like on NFL Network last week, they had you remember the scene from Bill Murray, you know, like Cinderella story, right? Just, uh, you know, where he's like whacking yeah. the the flowers and yeah, all that yeah. stuff. They had Romo doing that in a in another version why? last week. Why? Yeah. Who associates Tony Tony Romo with Bill Murray? I guess just because Romo's a big golfer and maybe. You know, maybe yes. he loves Caddyshack. I don't know. That's a stretch. But that was a stretch. I also did not understand the Miller Coors Blue Moon thing, like the cross promotion. And like, I missed that. And I, because I remember hearing in uh, advance that there was going to be like two of the biggest brands in beer coming back to the, it was like apparently it had been like 30 years since Miller Light and Coors Light had advertised in the Super Bowl. They did it so, together, and it was right. like, this is better, this is better, and then all of a sudden, they get both wiped out, and they're like, this is a Blue Moon commercial. Like, it, <laughs> I don't know. It was, I just didn't understand it. I didn't really get it. I don't know. Did they all spend like two and a half million on that one? Like, how did that, how did Might that have. I don't, know. I don't know. It was just odd. It was just odd. I don't know. I bet so, too. <clears throat> I'm trying to think of any other good ones that, that because there was a couple that I liked. <laughs> okay, that was, that's all right. Buckle. Um. I don't know. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I should have written them down as we were going along. Uh, basically, my my idea of writing them down was like texting you, I think, during the, <laughs> during the game. You need you're to like, check your text, Jane. You're like, I'm not even here. You're not, I'm not even there yet. I'm behind. I'm like, oh, sorry. 
You know, we were going back to the announcers. Zone six says Greg Olson is way more prepared than Robo. And I don't know if it's he's that he's prepared. Like we lost Sean again, and I'm sure he had a uh, a wonderful thing to say about the way Greg Olson is not as prepared as Tony Romo or, or is more prepared than Tony Romo, excuse me. But, uh, I, you know, I just, Greg Olson, I think he understands the rules. I think he understands what's going on. I think, I think he does that just fine. But my, my issue with, with Greg Olson, he was just blah. Was like, I don't know. You, you, you cut out in the middle of your sentence. Yeah. Like if, if Romo would have been calling that pass interference, you know, like whereas Olson was very, you know, forceful with his opinion about it. You know, Roman would be like, oh, I don't know, Jim. Uh, could it be? Yes, it be. <laughs> like Olsen, you know, again, Olsen is really up on the rules and game strategy and stuff like that. And Romo can be, but it's like he's kind of like thinks that he's trying to be this guy from three or four years ago. And it's like not even close to the same guy that he was, he really knows the rules and, and game situations and stuff like that as well. I think he just needs to go back to explaining it. I think he's trying to be some kind of entertainer and he's, yeah. he's not, he's not getting there. Right. You know, and maybe, you know, I've heard some people say, you know, like a disconnection with Nance potentially in the booth as well. You know, so I have no idea if that has anything to do with it, but I feel like, like early on, you know, it wasn't just Romo Nostradamus. It was also like Romo was really good with a lot of that, you know, that, was. that game stuff, game situations yeah. and, and you know, like end of game, you know, like end of game, you know, this is what you need to do and all these different things. I think he just needs to get back to that more and speak more in complete sentences right. and he'd be fine. Yeah, know? as opposed to trying to be Bill Murray in a commercial like that. Yeah. Just it, go back to doing what you were doing. Yep. Boo, Derek, boo. Wow. <laughs> wow. <sighs> All right. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up because my mic has already dropped <laughs> twice tonight and I don't I want know, it right? to drop a third time trying to finish this off. So that's fair. Um, great stuff. Hopefully, yeah. we have some kind of update on what's going on tomorrow with the stay, offensive coordinator. We'll find out. Yeah, stay locked in at boards.irishbreakdown.com. And, of course, you and Jesse will be back at 6, and I'm sure that the guys will have a show at 1 o'clock. There's a rumor Oh boy, the whiteboard is, oh. is coming out tomorrow on the show. Look out. Yep, whiteboard is coming out yes. on tomorrow's show. So be ready for that. Looking forward. Can't wait. All right. Hit that like button again. Subscribe, rate, and review. Leave us a five-star review and uh, comment and all that good stuff as well. We will talk to you tomorrow on IB Nation Sports Talk.